I ask everyone I interview, whether you are right out of school or a principal engineer, what is a project that you are most proud of? The reason I ask that is because I want to see and hear their excitement. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Dev Interrupted. I'm your host, Dan Lines, and today I'm joined by Jenny McDougal, Director of Engineering at Reprise. Jenny, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Awesome, you know, having you on the pod here. And before we start, of course, I want to thank you for being at Interact. You were a great speaker. And for anyone in the audience who may have missed Interact, Jenny joined us for a panel discussing building successful engineering organizations. If you're interested in listening to that conversation, highly recommended. It features speakers from Stack Overflow, Data Stacks. It was released as a pod episode. You can find that also on our YouTube channel. So totally check that out. Jenny's awesome. And in preparing for this pod uh, with you, Jenny, we were uncovering so much great wisdom on how to inspire, grow, and empower developers. We figured the best way to get a handle on all of it was to talk about the three most important conversations that you regularly have with developers in your life. So we're gonna do a range of things from recruiting, daily productivity, being a member of a larger company. But before we get into all of that, let's give our listeners a chance to know you a little bit better. I looked at your LinkedIn. You did not come from a formal computer science background. So how did you get into software engineering and therefore kind of touching the lives of so many developers, not formally coming from that space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you are 100% correct. I actually graduated with a degree in international business and a minor in French. So director of engineering is a big change and pretty much after graduating, I had no idea what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. I ended up joining a startup. I was maybe the 30th employee and it was in the insurance industry. I knew nothing about insurance, but figured I would just give it a shot. So I joined using the software that they were building and we were just growing like crazy. So every year we were doubling. And so for me, I was, I had a phenomenal manager who actually took me under her wing. And every time she got promoted, I pretty much took her old job. So for a while, I thought it was totally normal to get a promotion every like six months wow. and be leading more and more teams, <laughs> which turns out not normal. But I was so fortunate to be kind of part of that journey. So for the first five years I was at that company, I, was leading teams on the operation side of things. I knew the product very well that we were working on, which then led me to doing app support for the same company, which then led to QA, managing QA, then more of a um, kind of scrum master and more on the engineering leadership side, and then an engineer manager and then director of engineering. So. Yeah, after 10 and a half years at that first company, we went from 30 employees to over 5,000 and then went to another startup. And then I joined Reprise after that. Perfect. I mean, I think lesson learned here. If you don't know what you're doing out of school and you want to get promoted really rapidly, <laughs> join a startup and get your Absolutely. career launched in some amazing direction. That's my, my takeaway. But yeah, very, very obviously kind of like a rapid growth career for you. And the mentorship, I mean, always, uh, I guess that that's always also the lesson. If you can get in with a great mentor, you had a woman that was kind of like paving the way for you. Perfect. Plus the startup, that's the way to go. <laughs> so our first topic here around important conversations, we're going to start with applicants. And in particular, I think you have a little bit of a passion for the junior developer, which a lot of teams and companies kind of fear bringing on junior devs. I have that same feeling sometimes. And right now, actually in the world, I mean, recruiting is really tough. Like if you were, if you're saying to yourself, we're only going to get senior people or something like that, it's very difficult and you have to have a lot of money to do so because there's so much competition. 
So bringing in those junior devs is a good idea right now, but it is scary. And I know the question that you like to ask when you're interviewing is something like, what's your favorite project? That's a question you ask the developers. So why do you ask that question or what, what, what's up with that? I ask everyone I interview, whether you are right out of school or even in school as a co-op or a principal engineer, what is a project that you are most proud of? The reason I ask that is because I want to see and hear their excitement and how proud they are of their accomplishment. And it's open-ended enough that they could pick anything. And how they answer that question tells you so much more than just what they like to work on or how they like to work, but it shows their passion, their enthusiasm, how much of a self-starter they are. Sometimes if they choose to answer with a, a personal project rather than something they have done at work. But it really, it also starts the conversation in many different ways. Then I can kind of dig into what they would do differently. So can they take feedback? What did they learn from that experience? And really get a feel for how they are as, as a person and kind of how they think about different challenges and how they come up with different solutions. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And I'm happy that you mentioned, like, it's not even just junior developers. Cause when I read this kind of o opening part of the pod, I was thinking this is just an amazing question for anyone. It can kind of give you a, a look, I think, into their, into their soul, or like you said, their, their passion, what are they, what are you really all, all about? What types of answers do you get? When you at, do you have any like categories of answers that you get from developers when you, when you ask that question? Yeah, I would say for most devs that are very early in their career, a lot of them are group projects, which is great. Most people hate group projects. There's always one doer and many others who are just on the team. So from there, you can, um, kind of dig into how was the work divided? What areas of the project did you own? How did you collaborate? Was there any pair programming or anything like that? So being able to figure out how group projects were um, worked on and how they collaborate is super important. There's also a lot of folks that may not have gone to school for CS and they have a lot of personal projects. And I love digging into how they like to learn. Is it YouTube? Is it reading? Is it documentation? Is it just let me put the, my hands on a keyboard and figure it out? So that gives you a lot of insight into will they, will they thrive in our environment that we have or will they kind of struggle if, if they're looking for something that we might not offer? Yeah. I always like to see with this type of question, are they saying that they like a project that is something internal from like a company that they worked at, or do they give you an answer of an external project that they're working on? I think that can kind of tell you something about the person. In my experience, I actually like when they say like something they worked on personally, because it kind of, you know, usually, <laughs> usually I'm at a startup, I'm at a startup now, it kind of shows that entrepreneurial spirit. Hey, they can take on something new. They can be creative. They're in an area of their life that they're hungry to learn. Cause usually for an external project, you know, you can Absolutely. Learn, that, learn on your own. So I typically like, like that type of response. Not that I wouldn't like one that it's like, okay, you know, here's what I did at my company and I worked with a team that's on, you know, that can, that can be good too. But are there certain, like, I don't know, characteristics specifically with junior developers while you're interviewing that you that would say to you, oh, I want this person at my company or vice versa, like, you know, red flag. I would say for folks in college or just out that personal projects that they started because they wanted to learn that language. They read a blog and they had never used that programming language before and they were really interested in it. And the best way they know how to really learn it is to use it. So they think of any sort of project and then they go try it out. And it shows the, that they can work autonomously 
that they're eager and hungry to learn something new. They're not afraid of challenges. They're not afraid to ask questions or take on pretty complex situations. It makes sense to me because if I'm hiring a, a junior developer, obviously they're not going to have all the skills that I need most likely at, at, at my company, you know, to be successful yet, but you're really trying to test them. How quickly can you improve or how quickly can you gain momentum? And if you're able to measure that in the interview, I would think that's kind of like one of the top characteristics, like speed of improvement or, or something like, like that, right? Yep. Pretty much velocity to ramp up. What do you think on the other side, when you're, when you're looking at junior developers, do you have anything that would stand out as like a red flag or like a can candidate you would say, okay, this is, this is not the type of behavior that I want to bring in. Yeah. It's, I've worked at a handful of startups. And we need folks that work under urgency. We don't want to be going a thousand miles an hour all the time, but know that we need to get things done. So if, if a candidate is, is very reluctant to try anything new or that the only way they can learn something is through pair programming or the only time they have ever really learned a new programming language or something else was in a group, then we are a pretty small dev team. We've grown very quickly recently, but a year ago when I started, there were maybe seven engineers. Now we're up to 30, but it's still relatively small. So we don't have, we definitely have plenty of support, but not to essentially hold somebody's hand for a very long time to slowly ramp up. We want folks that can, for the most part, hit the ground running, but it's more about the, the attitude and eagerness to learn than it is the knowledge that you have at this moment. Cause we can teach a great candidate, a great person, anything they need to know to be successful. A lot of it is, is their willingness and openness to learning and trying new things. Yeah. There's a, you can kind of sense their, their spirit where they're at, if they're kind of more reluctant. Probably going to a bigger company or, or, you know, bigger companies are usually a little slower paced. You might have like a very formal mentorship program that can be good for, for a junior, junior developer. I remember when I was interviewing for my first startup. So I think I was like 21 or 22 years old at the time, a lot of energy, didn't have that much experience in development, mostly only coming from college and, you know, kind of these fake little projects, but I did have a project that I was working on. I think I called it enlightened at the time. And it was kind of like a web 2.0 or 3.0 where I wanted to make every web page more interactive. You could click anywhere. There'd be like little, uh, light boxes that came up and I just presented that project at the interview. So I just said like, Hey, you know, I don't really have too much technical experience. Here's the project I'm working on outside of work here. You know, here's the technology behind it. Here's how I think it will help the internet. And they, and they were like blown away by that. So I got the job. Right. And then ended up becoming the VP of engineering at that company, like nine years later. So I guess I'll, also a tip, if you are a junior de developer, you <laughs> want to get into the startup scene, make sure you're working on projects, show that energy in the interview. Now, Jenny, for you, is your team made up of more junior devs than normal? Or is it just kind of like a little bit of a, a passion that you have of not minding hiring juniors? Yeah, I would say we have a pretty good mix at this point. At this moment, it's probably a little, maybe software engineer too heavy. We are very much looking to hire senior and principal developers right now, but it is, it's definitely a passion that I really enjoy working with these software engineers early in their career that are so excited to, to jump in and figure it out. And so once you, you found the right person, you have the right candidate, you see kind of that spirit of improvement, fast paced. Is there anything that you're doing once they join to make them successful and kind of get them integrated with the team quickly? Yeah. So when anyone joins, whether you are a co-op or all the way up to principal, all new hires actually get paired up with a buddy. And so that is their go-to person for any and all questions. 
We have weekly one-on-ones, myself and them, just to figure out how they're doing. Our company is fully remote, so making sure that they are getting enough support, um, able to communicate, ask questions when they need to. And then I always set up either monthly or maybe every two months, depending on an individual, career chats. So making sure that we are having conversations about what they want to be when they grow up and figuring out how I can I can support them and maybe facilitate some of that. So it sounds like you do actually, not not like maybe a huge enterprise where there's like this super formal, you know, month by, I don't even know, year by year track, but you do have a mentorship program in a buddy. And it sounds like you thought about a support system. So they're kind of not, yep. you know, floundering, I guess, in the beginning. And then a little bit of like career talk conversation. One thing that I, I found that junior developers struggle with, because I, re I remember this myself at one point, is really understanding the full ecosystem of the software delivery life cycle. And I'll kind of explain what that means. Understanding, okay, what happens to your code, you know, when you open a pull request? What tests are running? What do you need to be thinking about? What are the dependencies and conflicts? How do you go through that cycle? What happens after your code gets merged? What happens after it gets deployed? How do you measure if it's doing well? You know, when you're a junior developer, at least for me, I was like kind of living just in my little world, just I'm developing. And the more I think you can show a junior the full ecosystem early on, then they're like, oh, this is how it really works. So one tip that I, I have, I always tried to get at any employee, but especially the juniors, get a task end to end done quickly in the first few weeks, even if it's just changing something small so they can see that full life cycle and get code out to prod. I think that helps. Uh, what do you think about that? Absolutely. We actually have our new hires releasing code to production on day one. So we, <laughs> we give them a handful of ramp up stories. The first couple of days, a lot of them are text changes, very simple cosmetic changes that exactly as you said, allow the new engineer to see the entire development life cycle end to end. So they at least understand what's going on before they have to figure out a complex issue, get the fix in and then get it out to production. So making sure that they understand how it works, how we do what we do with the simple tasks yeah. has definitely helped. Super important. I mean, I think that's one of the, a good takeaway from this pod. Usually when I hear failure stories, I did work at a company before I worked at that startup company where I eventually became the VP of engineering. I worked at a more traditional company for about, I don't know, nine months maybe. And my code never made it to prod the whole time. <laughs> so like I was like, and I, so I was like, I don't know. It's just like confu confusing, like, where do I really fit in? I'm working on this. And it was like this old school, you know, more waterfall setup. But still, usually when I hear the failure stories, it's like, yeah, I worked on something and I don't even know what happened to that code. So you do the exact opposite day one, which is great. Now you started talking about this a bit. Important conversation number two is around asking devs on your team. What do you actually want to work on? So this is after you found some good talent. We talked about juniors, but it could be seniors. The next question is, what do you actually want to work on? Which does seem, you know, straightforward on the surface, but maybe it, it, it's not. So tell me like the essence of that question for you. Definitely a straightforward question that is sometimes really hard to answer. There are many, especially engineers earlier in their career, or if they've done some engineering, but we have a different stack or totally different product, they don't really know what the options are, really understand what the options are or how to, what am I trying to say? <laughs> how to work on what how to figure out what they want to work on. So having the conversation of what do you, what do you really enjoy doing? And for my, my teams, I use a donut exercise. I think it was once started as an onion, but donuts are way more fun. Way so more fun. yeah, onion of all the foods. 
probably <laughs> don't tell me. Okay. What's up with the donut exercise? Yeah. So for typically I do a sprint. So for us, it's two weeks. And for every single task that an engineer works on, they just write it down on a post-it as, as simple as it is. So stand up meetings, working on bugs, working on features, kind of everything that makes up their, their daily schedule. Mm -hmm. At the end of the sprint, we essentially on a huge piece of paper, draw a donut. So there's the donut hole, the donut itself, and then outside the donut. The donut hole, you put all the sticky notes of all the things you absolutely love to do, all the things you love working on, and any tasks that you would be kind of sad if I took them away. Yeah. The donut itself is made up of all the things that are, that are part of the job. They're fine. Doesn't get you super excited, but they're not terrible. And then outside of that donut is all of the work that you would love to never have to do again. So all of those tasks that you just find annoying or mundane or challenging in a kind of negative kind of way. <laughs> yeah. Do you do this with each developer? Yeah. So pretty much you could do it with on an individual basis and there's a few different ways to look at it. So on the individual basis, you really want most of the tasks to focus around that donut hole part of the yeah. things you love. That at donut a, is what I like to do the most. Yes. The filling, the cream filling. Okay. Yeah. What do you usually <laughs> hear when you ask, a like, what do developers put in that middle? This is interesting to me. So definitely depends on the developer. Yeah. But many of them, especially the individual contributors, love pretty much going heads down on tasks, not being on any sort of defect or bug duty, working on challenging problems working on new features that are relatively well-defined by the product team and being able to kind of come up with, sometimes come up with their own uh, solutions. So rather than taking exactly what product is bringing from the customer, but creating some, cre some of their own solutions. Yeah. Solving problems, especially the more junior developers, maybe as you're getting more and more experience, you start saying. I want to look at strategy more. I want to, again, look at the full ecosystem. I want to help the team, but it's like junior developers. I can't like, why did I get into this? Solve cool problems, cool solutions. Yep. It's pretty simple. And that's, I mean, that's where you'll get a red flag also with a junior who either leaves your company or is unhappy. It's like, I'm not solving interesting problems. Exactly. Yeah. And when you do this donut, if you take a quick glance at it and see that most of the sticky notes are on the outside, that could be a very clear indication that they're not really happy. It's visualizing they the might problem. might be looking. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, a visual, you can see it. If it wasn't obvious before, now it is to you as a, as a leader. Exactly. And you can also look at them within the scrum team. Some engineers really love solving smaller bugs or working more collaboratively than others. And if you can swap tasks within a given scrum team or the whole engineering team, if you're flexible enough, but kind of taking away some stuff that they don't love doing every day and giving it to someone that really enjoys it could be a, an easier way than trying to find, trying to hire someone outside to do some of these tasks or to just kind of tell someone to suck it up. I mean, it's reality. It's a job. There's always something that you don't love doing, but you got to do anyway. So keeping that in mind, but making sure that they actually are really enjoying what they're working on. Right. So you kind of use it to, you can formulate your team, balance the responsibilities of who likes doing what. What do you usually hear on the outside of the donut? Like, is there any common, you know, things that you hear a few times over and over? Meetings. Yeah. And obviously meetings are essential, but I would say any meeting over one hour needs to be changed, especially so Reprise is a fully remote company and being on Zoom in the same meeting, going over the same stuff for over an hour, 
sometimes even over a half hour, can be draining, exhausting, people lose focus. So really kind of dialing in on those longer meetings to figure out how we can better use that time. And then some more, again, depending on the individual, some people really like collaborating, some people don't. But I would say meetings, especially long ones, are the number one thing outside of that donut. Yeah. It really makes sense. Developers don't want to sit in meetings. It's such a bummer. It's so boring. It is. <laughs> um, yeah. One thing I, I will say, so this is a great exercise, you know, and then anyone listening, you can kind of do it your own way. You can use the donut, but at the end of the day, you're trying to understand kind of where the passion is, where the problems are, and it, it will visualize it for you. I do find if you ask that question, what do you actually want to work on? And you're kind of getting not a straightforward answer. Typically it's a yellow flag for a developer. And that's where you, and it doesn't matter if they're a developer or not, to be honest, but we're talking developers. That's where you should probably have that separate short meeting, but they'll appreciate half hour meeting that says, okay, you don't know exactly what you, you want to be working on, which means there's kind of like a lack of passion, which is a, a red flag sign. Let's look at, okay, here's the technologies that we're using. Is there anything that you're interested in? Here's other projects that are going on in the companies or something that catches your eye and kind of help move them to a different area. That would be my advice in that situation, because if they just stay in what they're doing, you know, they didn't say, oh, I really like working on the thing that I'm doing right now. It can be a problem sooner rather than later. Definitely. And it also helps guide some careers in that if they love collaborating and helping folks out and really making, making a difference and having an impact across kind of the, the bigger organization, maybe they want to become a manager or at least a team lead. But some engineers say they want to be a team lead and all of the outside of this donut is all of the meetings and collaborating and chatting with other teams and mentoring, which they might want it because that is a, sometimes that's seen as really the logical step in a career. But if that's all the stuff that they don't love doing, that might not be the right path. <laughs> Perfect. You can kind of find what type of person it is and the right path for them. The things that are on the outside of the donuts are the things that they don't like. Do you ever find that you can, do you find like automation ideas or things that you could automate away? Definitely. We have done a pretty good job so far of keeping those to a minimum, the things outside the donut and anything that we can automate, we try to do and really trying to minimize any extra processes or like re running reports. We have automated many of them actually using linear B to do so. So I don't have to spend a half hour trying to figure out team velocity all the time or every sprint. So using different tools, trying to figure out the best tools for the job and really getting to work on the stuff that makes a, makes a difference and makes an impact rather than kind of all the, the fluff on the outside. Yeah. I mean, a, a tool like linear B, it's going to show you, Hey, here's where the bottlenecks are in the development process. And the areas that you have bottlenecks, like for example, in your cycle time are going to be the areas that developers are experiencing something negative. Now a developer is not going to say my cycle time is uh, too long. No, they're going to say, Hey, in this PR process where I put up a PR you know, five days ago and haven't gotten a comment back, this sucks. So that's, yep. you know, they might say, oh, on the outside of the donut, our, our PR reviews, it's like, they take too not long. Fun. So yeah, they'll say something like that. So you can have some, some tools that show visibility. And I know, you know, you're using linear B a bunch, which is great. Love having you as a customer, but that's, yeah, that's why I really like this, uh, donut exercise. I think those things on the outside, you can use it as where do we need to automate? Because if one developer is saying something negative about their experience, probably, you know, 40, 40 to 50% of the team is feeling the same thing, even if they're not, you know, saying anything. Okay, great. So yeah, thanks for sharing that exercise. Very valuable. The last part of the important conversation. So 
item three here, get developers to ask, do you want it fast or want it to be completed? So this is relating, I think, to a feature or test. Do you want it fast or do you want it complete? What is the essence behind that statement? Yeah, so really it's about sparking a conversation and starting the conversation, mostly between engineers and product. Product managers, they have one of the hardest jobs, I think, in software. They're getting a lot of feedback from customers and they're trying to navigate a roadmap, trying to put out fires if necessary and keep everyone on track and have firm priorities that the team can really kind of march towards and figuring out kind of the, the importance and why we're working on what we're working on. So do they want it fast? Like, is this something that they just need to kind of check a box or is this a bigger feature that we need to think about scalability and performance and how much of an impact across the entire platform or application is this going to have? And really understanding the why behind a feature really gets to the kind of essence of, can it be fast? Should it be complete? If it needs to be complete, which we obviously don't want to write a bunch of throwaway code, but figuring out kind of what what is complete and how how big is this ask in reality this is a complicated conversation especially for i mean a junior developer no one told me to have like ask this type of question but really it's i think around and i agree the product manager role is very difficult you have outside influence you have internal stakeholders you have deadlines that you're committing to it's hard to understand what's going on in the engineering process. Why is it taking so long? Usually things are late, but is this something that you're coaching your developers to ask to a product owner or how, how is that question being used? Yeah. So I would say that it's more of something for them to keep in mind. Some software engineers want to over-engineer something because they thought of this brilliant idea. That's going to change the world and solve everything. But really it's, it's a small, like in our case, one pointer that really just needs to be done pretty quick rather than kind of a two week effort. So having the kind of fast or complete question in their back of their minds helps to ask product more questions. Um, and at Reprise, we also started architecture hours. So because we're a fully remote company, it, I've realized that it is a lot harder to ask questions. You have to be more deliberate. You have to give context. You have to be more clear. So we actually started what we call architecture hours. It's really just a half hour, um, every day, but all of our principal engineers and team leads hop on a zoom call and pretty much wait for any and all questions that the rest of the team has. It's a great facilitator of collaboration and communication between, and product is also welcome to join. So many of my teams, actually the product manager, the team lead, and really any other engineer on the team can go and discuss kind of the bigger impact that a feature can have, or they can come and bring their two or three different options or different solutions that they came up with to discuss the pros and cons of each to figure out how to move forward with that feature. Do developers show up? Do they join? They do. It definitely takes a little while for them to get comfortable. I would say that all new hires, I encourage them to go and just sit there and listen because we're not in an office and you can't just overhear kind of naturally the conversations going on with your um, teammates. This is our, our attempt at creating that for at least a small piece of the day, every day. And as they hear more questions and listen to how the more experienced engineers are thinking about different solutions, it gives them a better sense of the bigger architecture of the company and how we want to approach certain situations. That's great. Yeah. That's a really cool takeaway. And I think like on the coaching side for developers, I mean, 
do you want it done fast or do you want it done complete? In the long run, I think we always want it done complete or that, that's my mindset, at least scalable. You iterate on the feature value and all of that. But I think there's a conversation with product on, of course, how is this being used? Is this a beta? Do how many customers are going to use it at first? Are you trying to get something out quick? If you're trying to get something out quick, maybe you want to, if you're a developer, bring to the product owner, I could get this out quick, but if you really, if we really need this to scale, this is what it looks like after I get it out quick. Here's the iterations that I need to go through. And that I think is a healthy balance because a good product owner, the ones that understand, especially some of the like concepts that we talk about a lot, like how quickly can you deliver value metrics that describe value delivery? If you let them in and know, Hey, you know what, if I do this the right way or the complete way, now we're going to deliver more features long-term. If I do this like a shortcut way, it's going to hurt us with technical debt. And I think the good product owners realize that part of their product is how quickly can you get new value out? Absolutely. And it is, it's also a good coaching tool for product to give examples of why something might be, might take longer or create so much tech debt. They might just not realize how, how kind of expensive in the tech debt world, a feature or an ask might be. So having that respect and conversation across teams is so important. So uh, as a director of engineering, the last thing I want to ask you in this area, how do you balance like product and engineering and the speed and quality thing? Like what, what is your role in that as a director? Yeah. So I try to make, we always want to make sure that everything is kind of sustainable. If we need to, we can absolutely kind of ramp up and go a hundred miles an hour, but no one can do that for long without burning out. So we try to have a very good work-life balance. So making sure that we are being reasonable about what work that we are committing to. We do some sprint math to make sure that velocity of the team makes sense given how individuals are performing, any holidays, vacations, and stuff like that. But making sure that I have constant and collaborative conversations with the product team, that we're delivering enough value every sprint, but also not asking folks to work 18 hour days just to get something out. I think collaborating with deadlines and being clear about what we're really committing to and what we're able to get out in a given time frame is so important. Everybody always means well and sometimes sales and product don't fully understand how big a feature is. So making sure that we are breaking down all of the larger tasks that we are collaborating and communicating efficiently with the other teams at our company is super important and not being afraid to kind of put a pause on some features. If they, if we thought it was going to be quick and it went sideways on the second day, someone was working on it, let's pause, let's have a conversation. Let's figure out why it's going to take two weeks instead of two hours and reevaluate if that is in fact, what we want to work on. And making sure that we give product as much information and time to consider if we don't hit this deadline, what does it mean? And kind of be able to communicate with them as to what's going on and why. Yeah. It's one of the things we talk at Linear B the most about. It's communicating around predictability. What the business is looking for from an engineering team is being predictable on when you're going to deliver. And so if that's changing, right, the more predictable you can be, the better. And when that changes early on, like having that open conversation is like the best thing you can do early. So that totally resonates with me. We have one sort of fun question at the end here. What's a life changing experience you wish everyone could have? Wow. That's like a really Ooh. existential question for you. <laughs> it is great question. I would say study abroad. Many listeners are probably out of college by now, but encourage the younger folks, you know, to study abroad if they're, if they go to college and if not, when you travel, get off the beaten path, 
go fully immerse yourself in the culture and the places you visit rather than always kind of staying towards all the tourist traps, but <laughs> all the overly well-known places. Go on, go on adventures and get and to know the locals. Perfect time to do it. Even if you're not, you know, right out of school, we're in a remote or hybrid remote world. So a lot of companies will let you go work for work wherever you want. So yeah, great advice. Um, and go visit your teams. <laughs> yeah. And go see your teams. Yeah. Great. That's very important as well. Jenny, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It was great to collaborate and see you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dan. We always like to give our guests an opportunity to kind of pitch or promote something. I know for you, you're hiring. What's going on in your organization? What roles do you have open and where can I go if I would like to join your team? Yes, we are looking for senior and principal engineers and you can get uh, more information at getreprise.com slash careers. So check out our careers page and we are looking for the more senior folks for a awesome. dev team. Perfect. Yeah. Cause you got those juniors already lock, locked down. So yeah, yes. if you're a uh, uh, more senior dev looking to join an awesome engineering team with Jenny, go to the careers page at reprise. I also want to say thank you to more than the 2000 of you who are now subscribed to our weekly interruption newsletter. We bring you articles from the community and inside information on our weekly pods. Anything that we talked about today will be in link form in the description below. See everyone next week. And Jenny, thank you again for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dan.